Well, well then, then, how are you? Hi, Kaya. Very good. How are you? Good. How are things in Sri Lanka today? Well, it's the middle, the middle of the night, isn't it, for you? Yeah, it's 4.30 p.m. here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll um, just wait, uh, probably start on, you know, uh, at 11 o'clock because um, uh, this is straight after a number of other uh, tracks have been, fit, you know, another other um, presentations have been finishing on other tracks. So um, some of those people like a little bit of time to do more than click, you know, click to the click to the round table. They might need to um, you know, grab a glass of water or something. So uh, we'll get started shortly. So you were saying you um you've done quite a few webinars recently. Yeah. So <clears throat> I did a meetup recently, like about two months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, done a couple of webinars before that. Yeah. I know these are all virtual um, meetups. I take it, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for anybody who's just joining us in the audience, while we're waiting to start, uh, we'll be using the uh, online chat uh, to take any questions. We've got some people uh, just joining us now, so that's great. Yeah, so have you um, had a chance to uh, join in much of the rest of the conference? Uh, well, not much. We, we joined for the session, uh, the round table session yesterday. Yes. Uh, yeah. How did you think that went? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Pretty good. Yeah, there were lots of interesting questions. Uh, so I, yeah, that's uh, really yeah. good. Yes, it's always um, uh, you know, it's always a good a good mix. Um, okay, we'll just wait um another another minute, I think, before we get started, and I'll uh, um to introducing everyone. Well, as expected, here we have more people joining the session. Welcome everybody to joining us online. Um, yeah, no, it's certainly been a, uh, a packed agenda, but of course, this is where it's happening right now. So uh, <laughs> great, to, great to have you all here. A little bit of um, uh, a kind of like a grainy background noise. I don't know if that, if I put myself on. Go away if I go on mute. No, not Fazan either. Yeah, maybe it's just a little bit of uh, a little bit of interference or something. Can you hear anything? Do we hear it now? Yeah. I think it's on the mic, yeah. So after, I, so after I muted it, uh, this, do you, you are not, you are not hearing that? Yeah. It's just a, it's it just a little bit of a, like, you know, um, white, white noise in the background. Oh, Some, sometimes, I don't know whether it's sometimes um, Bluetooth things. That seems okay. All right. Well, um, we're uh, we're at twelve o'clock, so uh, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, to those who just joined us, my name is Claire Barrett at APIs First Consulting, um, and I'm privileged to uh, have the opportunity to moderate uh, this session, brought to you by uh, WSO2 as a um, gold sponsor uh, of API Days, and uh, 
uh, it's um, only through their sponsor, through sponsorship um, by organisations like them, uh, that uh, those of you in the broader API community um, can get an opportunity to um, have time with uh, leading technical experts. Uh, and delighted to uh, um, have Faislan Nazim and Nalinta Amarasinga joining us today. They are, uh, they both work in the same team uh, at WSO2 uh, and um, uh, are to each technical leads in that area. Um, so they're uh, really deep um, uh, experts and have uh, uh, the opportunity to share with you uh, their insights and experience today. We'll be using uh, the online chat as a way for any of you to contribute um, questions as we go. Uh, we did get sent through some, some questions from uh, those of you that uh, pre-registered uh, for this workshop. Um, uh, we'll hope to get some of those um, as a, uh, particularly to provide a bit of a general overview of uh, some of the security uh, considerations at WSO2. And um, then uh, Melinda and Fazan have also um, suggested some topics that uh, they would really like um, to be able to share with you that some of the latest thinking that they're, uh, that they're dealing with. So, so that's how we're on the session. It is an informal session. It's not a, it's not a presentation per se. They, they've got slides on, on hand um, uh, to help the conversation uh, if we need. Um, and we really look forward, particularly for those of you um, who are joining us uh, to uh, put, put the questions that are burning on your mind um, into the online chat as we go. So, um, so Kazan, Melinda, would you like to just uh, introduce yourselves and what, what you're doing day to day uh, to give the team some, give, give the audience some context? Right. So, as Claire uh, introduced, uh, I work as a technical lead uh, at WSU2. So, I have been with WSU2 for the last uh, about five and a half years. And I started off with a, a team uh, related to machine learning, and then I moved on to API management. And that's that have been uh, since then. So currently, I'm uh, I'm um, more involved in uh, uh, overlooking the analytics platform at, of API Manager. So these days, we are working on uh, a cloud native analytics platform. So I also involved in other uh, related discussions related to API management uh, within that yeah. So. So I'm uh, Malin Tamar Singh. So I've been uh, working in WSO2 about uh, five years. Uh, uh, so I actually started uh, from API management team. Um, so, uh, so in the me, so I was working as a co-member of uh, API develop internal API development team, and also I have been uh, working with uh, the CI/CD, uh, CI/CD aspects of the API manager product as well. Uh, in, a, in, in during the past, so um, yeah. Great and uh, fantastic to have you joining us uh, today. Um, I'm going to just start off with some very general um, context uh, setting questions uh, that we got from um, people that registered, uh, and they were asking about um, uh, in general, which what security would you use for what type of API? Uh, very broad, um, but we'd love to get your kind of you know high-level perspective right so uh, so in general like uh, right now we are living in a world where you have uh, various types of apis right so we have rest apis graphql apis uh, grpc and various other types so uh, certainly the microservices architecture has like enabled uh, developers to use uh, various types of apis within a single solution so the question is like, uh, how do we secure various uh, types of API? Uh, so if you if, if we talk about security, we are uh, talking about a few basic things like uh, how do we apply confidentiality, integrity, uh, authentication, authorization, rate limiting, uh, these aspects. So uh, <laughs> depending uh, on the API type, for example, let's, let me take REST API as an example. So if you are taking, uh, if you are trying to secure REST API uh, <clears throat> about confidentiality and integrity, you might get it with uh, using SSL. And when it comes to authentication, there are various options, like uh, whether you would use OAuth 2 or uh, basic authentication, uh, mutual TLS, API keys. So these are options. 
and <clears throat> then you have uh, authorization options uh, for example you could use authoscopes for uh, authorizations or uh, if you if you need more fine grain authorization mechanisms you could use uh, sacral policies and when it comes to rate limiting rate limiting is also uh, uh, that is what uh, guarantees you the availability aspect of security right you need the system uh, to be available so rate limiting guarantees us uh, to give that so uh, when it comes to rest apis you can use uh, since an api could have multiple resources you could have you could assign various rate limiting levels for each resource right so let's say you have an api with uh, multiple resources uh, get users uh, post users so for get users you could say you should allow only 100 requests per minute for post request uh, post users you it's just only 50 requests per minute so these kind of uh, variations uh, you could apply to your uh, apply to your api so uh, these are the these are the main things that come to our mind when we are talking about security but there are also other aspects that uh, that often developers overlook but they are also important for example i would say for rest apis uh, let's take uh, let's take uh, using uh, secure using the http headers related to security for example the hts header uh, is called the http strict security transport header right so if you use that you could instruct the behave, uh, browser to behave in a certain way and instruct saying and um, don't send me http request for the next uh six months or one year right It, to ensure security and uh let's say you want to uh or the other header type i would like to say is uh, about the cache control headers if there is a sensitive information you don't want it to be cached in the browser so you could use these headers in the uh uh in the http header right to secure your api so uh there is no like special uh, there is no like special instruction on this is how you do uh, this is how you secure rest api this is how you secure graphic graph ql apis and so on but uh, there are uh, for example authentication authorization rate limiting how we do it might uh, change a little bit depending on the api type so uh, yeah that is the answer yeah that's great so um so I, I, something to add like uh, so when we like to, thinking about security of the aps so there are like uh, so few things that we additional in um, in addition to what faslan mentions like um, so there is uh, there are like 10 uh, 10 main important things so we call them os os top 10 security uh, things that we need to consider like when we are designing any kind of a rest api so so we need to consider about that as well so it's like um, so when you um, when you expose in data from your aps we need to make sure that you are exposing the only the uh, data that you need to expose like so there are some instances that like uh, in, in even in the real world that uh, there are like uh, some apis are returning too much of information but uh, in the ui there are some some sort of filtering has done to expose only certain of them but so when some attacker figure out that this api is um, actually getting lots of data to the ui but only showing few of them so so in they find out they are actually uh, the people and you know, lots of personal data of users might be exposed so so there are things like that and also so when you expose data we need to think of like uh, let's say like when you exposing ids Uh, we, we need to uh, we need to make sure things they are though are not uh, those are not uh, able to guess by other people so there are things like that we can also consider okay oh that's um that's really helpful um and uh, uh, again just sort of a contextual uh, level is how how can security as a service help in api management solutions more broadly it's been uh, something that Came through from our audience. Right. So, if you think about uh, anything as a service, if you're if you're using something as a service, uh, what that 
would mean is that you are trying to uh, use the the expertise of that service. For example, you may uh, <clears throat> you may want some capability within your API management solution that you don't have the expertise to build and maintain and patch and uh, uh, all those things, right? Let me take an example. Uh, with, uh, with WSR API Manager, uh, we are using currently two uh, services, security as a services. Uh, the first one is to detect uh, anomaly detection. So uh, we are partnered with uh, King AI, and uh, what we do is the gateway sends info request information to the King AI engine, and uh, that will build a machine learning model, and it will inform us that if there is some sort of an attack which is happening that cannot be detected by our static uh, rules that we have in our gateway. So because the, uh, the sophistications of, of the attacks are uh, varying too, too much that we cannot detect with stat uh, static rules. So we partnered with them. So we use that as a security as a service. That is one example. And another example I would say is uh, we have uh, partnered again with another company called 42 Crunch. Uh, what that does is that uh, it uh, audits our open API specification for security vulnerabilities. So the input we give is uh, the open API specification, and it gives us a score. Uh, it says how secure your API is, and it, it gives us some guidelines on uh, what to modify in our know, uh, open API specification. So those two areas, we realize that we don't have the expertise and uh, things to maintain. So uh, we use them as a security, as a service. So mm -hmm. I think. Uh, there can be other uh, other examples as well, but those two are the ones which come to my mind. Okay, that's great. Um, we've um, thank you for that. Uh, we've actually got um, some questions coming in from on the online chat now, so we'll we'll jump to those. Um, Mushtaq's asked if it's okay to expose an unsecured endpoint as the backend URL from the gateway. Um, uh, yeah. Who, who would like so, to? Yeah. Uh, so actually. Uh, so basically, let's say like uh, so people think like this like um, so when we have an API gateway, people often uh, expose their internal API internal endpoints through the gateway. So so most most of the time the gateway has in a, enforced the security to the backend APIs. Like so they have the API gateway in, enforces HTTPS and also authentication rate limiting and uh, all the basic and all the essential security aspects will be enabled by the gateway but the problem is uh, so when after the gate uh, like as the backend url might still be kept as an unsecured one so this api the backend api will be uh, will be still exposed as an unsecured one to the internal gate to the internal network so so people think that so the people uh, pe uh, people from the outside of the network or after outside the company cannot reach the a reach the backend URL backend directly. That is true, but uh, so there are like several cases we I mean um, which can which people internal people even can attack like so there are there are instances like uh, there are attacks coming from the internals of the internals of some companies so 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 what we say is even for the internal apis we should not be exposed we, we should not expose them as insecure one so the general practice is even for the internal ones we should expose at expose them at, at some sort of security at least i mean even you can yeah, yeah. so you yeah. can at least to see basic code or something then they, they can support it yeah, no, thank you. Um, and uh, we've also got a question from um, Elias, uh, um, which uh, maybe Fazlan, could you um, can you answer that? You can, I could read it out, but hopefully everybody can see it there online. And in fact, Arco's added a uh, comment as well about um, uh, DC standards emerging. So, um, so the first question is around um, uh, token-based security. Yeah. And Arco's asking questions about. Do you see uh, what sort of standards do you see emerging or best practicing practices on propagating identities? Right, uh, I'll just take Ilya's question. So I mm -hmm. believe uh, uh, what he's asking is that 
So you have uh, you have an application which has generated an access token, right? So now this access token might be an opaque token. It is just a random string. It doesn't have any user information. Now this uh, this uh, token is being used to access an API, and uh, now the, that API will be uh, proxying to a backend, some backend uh, API. So how do you transmit the user information? uh from the api to the uh, back end uh right so because now the token doesn't have any information about the user so how does the back end know about the user i believe that is what i i understand from the question so if that is uh, what he's asking then uh <clears throat> what we normally do yeah okay <laughs> right yeah acknowledge so <clears throat> the the pr uh, process of doing that is uh once we once the token is received to the gateway what what we do is a token introspection so this is actually validating whether the token is valid right so uh, if you see the token introspection spec uh, the this section about the, the in the spec it says that you could also have the user information also uh, returned in that uh, response right so in uh, even WSO2, what we do is uh, we once a, once a token comes into the gateway, we ask the authorization server who is the owner of this token. Give me the claims of this token, right? Uh, which means uh, other information like email address or whatever the other information of the user. So once uh, uh, the gateway receives all this information, then we uh, bundle this in a dot. This is a JWT, right? So you have a JWT which has all the information like this is the user, this is the email address, and this is the company is working for, and all those things. And then put it into a header, HTTP header, and send it to the backend. Now, uh, now the backend's responsibility is to check whether the received uh, JWT is actually uh, sent from the gate. So there is a, a responsibility of, of the, from the backend to uh, check whether the signature matches. This means uh, if the if the JWT token was sent, JWT header was sent from the gateway, uh, <clears throat> the backend should be able to match the signatures and verify that this is indeed from the gateway, so I should trust it. So then you have the backend has all those uh, user information. Uh, just the consumer application just only, only sent a OPAP token, right? But now we have all the information about the user, the backend. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, oh, we've got a follow up question actually, and uh, we've still got Darko's question on standards. So um, maybe I could I could throw to you to suggest how the order to uh, to answer them in. Um, I can read them out loud if you if you need. So um, Ilya's follow up is about um, if the token was generated using credentials grant type. Yeah, so yeah, so client uh, client credentials is actually uh, uh, it is not a grant type uh, that can uh, identify the user. So the client credentials is used in uh, uh, server to server communication scenarios like system to system, where where the system identifies to another system. You don't have a user, right? So uh, only instances like uh, authorization code grant or password grant. Uh, implicit ground where you could identify the user who is involved in the process. So uh, uh, in WSO2, in WSO2 API Manager, if you use the client credentials ground to uh, generate the token, uh, the user of that token will be the person, uh, the owner of the application. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's how we uh, determine who the owner of the token is. So we've um, got a question from Sunka here on how do we securely store access tokens in SPAs? Yeah, so so in SPA, so let's um, so think about a web browser. So that is uh, so that is the place uh, we are using. Uh, so so in in a typical web browser, like so, we can use several several ways to store like uh, several storage mechanisms like. Uh, like local storage and session storage 
and also there are there are the other ways using cookies so so the typical the typical recommendation is not to use a, a session storage or local storage to store any kind of any sensitive information of the user because that can be accessible by any kind of javascript so so let's say if your application got some attack and uh, an xss attack so this 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 sensitive inf information can be retrieved so what we what we usually what what we encourage is to have a mechanism which cannot be get which cannot be exploited by some sort of attacks like xss and also the attack, other attack is CSCSR, CSRF. So, the, so what we can do is to use a cookie, which is so there are several several types that we can uh, several several parameters that we can uh, uh, set to the cookies, like secure uh, and HTTP only uh, things like that. So, so when we we so what we can use what we can do is use a cookie which which is uh, HTTP only. So then it um, and also it is secured and also which is the same site so then when when you use the same site so this cookie cannot be extracted by any csr effect attack and also when, when you see the other other two parameters when specifying the token we so this cookie will not be transmitted in any kind of http call and also it cannot be read by uh, any kind of javascript so then uh, this can be uh, so we can consider it as secured when when uh, talking when when considering about the other options so that is an option we can use yeah so just want to add something for that uh, so this uh, same site uh, cookie uh, was introduced like uh, recently uh, so we uh, before that was introduced uh, when browsers don't did not support those uh, did not support the same site cookie the people had various custom solutions like you could have, you could do various kinds of things to avoid the csrf token so uh, for example in we we encountered the same issue when uh, we had to uh, mitigate the csr csrf uh, attack so we what we did in api manager portals is i think i believe still it's that that's how it works so we broke the token into two pieces and stored one piece in the http only cookie and another piece in a uh, Java script accessible cookie, okay? and uh, this uh, then once the uh, when the token when the when an API call will be sent, all the, those two parts will be combined at the server and then will be authenticated. So why they had to break this uh, into two is because to avoid the CSRF uh, attack. Because if uh, an at attack uh, uh, initiates a request like that, only part of the cookie will go to the server. So this is just one solution, but there could be various other ways uh, uh, to solve this. Okay, thank you um, so much. I might um, uh, might get into a couple of the other questions that came through uh, in our conversations um, before uh, this session, um, um, uh, um We have questions about what are the various approaches to rate limiting? Um, have you... Uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, I'll take it. Uh, so rate limiting uh, means that we are trying to limit the number of uh, requests that are coming into our servers, right? So it is uh, the idea of uh, serving uh, the legitimate users, uh, uh, at least a portion of the legitimate users uh, without affecting your service availability. Now, uh, the approaches of doing this, uh, are, there are various ways. Uh, you could use uh, user. Uh, you could use API by straight limiting. You could say that this API will be allowed only uh, thousand requests per minute, and then you could uh, just as I explained initially, you could have this uh, resource by straight limiting for APIs. For each resource, you could have a specific rate limit, and then you also have a concept of uh, application by straight limiting. So if a single application has multiple APIs subscribed to it, subscribed to it you could uh, apply a rate limit for the whole application. So you could say uh, 5,000 requests per minute for the whole application. And so these are some of the ways. And then you also could uh, 
uh, do things like uh, header based rate limiting so if this header comes you do uh, this is the rate limit and then ip based rate limiting and also uh, jwt claim ba claim based rate limiting so if if a user's organization is x y z then apply this rate limit so we, we can do various combination so what uh, i what i explained is a request based request count based rate limiting there is also a, a uh, the same things can be done on the bandwidth as well the request response bandwidth so in some cases that is what makes sense so if any of these things uh, doesn't uh, solve your problem then you also have uh, ways of writing custom policies to do rate limiting so uh, many of the api management solutions uh, do support this uh, that's that's uh that's great. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, we um, a little, another little uh, a slight change in terms of question. We, a lot of people um, are, um, if they're not experimenting, embracing more broadly uh, GraphQL um, uh, options for for APIs. And um, uh, what are some of your thoughts about any special precautions um, for GraphQL uh, um, security that uh, um, people are um, exploring at the moment or be considering? Yeah, so so when it comes to GraphQL, so there is so let's first compare it with uh, REST. So so the thing is when uh, when it comes to GraphQL, the user can specify what are the fields that we need that he needs. Especially the client can specify which what fields that is required to let's say to populate their UI things like that. So so. So the thing is, when using GraphQL, the user can specify, like, let's say you are getting some information of uh, some sort of, a, let's say, some some sort of a user or some sort of other things. So you can specify like some very, like very depth, very in a very, very high depth level information. So like, let's say in when it comes to the, come to the database, it might be going through very lots of uh, SQLs that can be very, um, very, very, it can be very complex and very costly with a CPU costly. So things like that. So that can be harmful to the database and also it will uh, slow down the APS and so the APS availability, there can be problems with the availability, things like that. So, so that is one special precaution when we think about GraphQL APS, which is this depth limiting. So when you giving a query, so the, we can limit to some set of some sort of depth limit. Like you can do only five, uh, five limit, five depth limit, things like that. And the other thing is, so when we, uh, so this is, uh, so when it comes to GraphQL, you can also specify what are the number of results that you need to get. So like, uh, let's say there, this is a book or some sort of inventory. Let's say there are lots of like, a million some um, some several lakhs of day lakhs of things and then the user can through the through the api the user can request let's say all the but when he trying to like um do an attack to the server while trying to re uh, retrieving all the data from the database so it can like uh, say from the graphql query that i need like one like let's say half a million of data half a million of results. So this amount limiting need to be done as a, also as a precaution. So that is uh, two special things that we can uh, think about GraphQL API. And also the other thing is uh, in the GraphQL, we can do multiple queries at once. Like let's say you are, so let's say there are, there is one query to get searching through some inventory and also then some another query to get the inventory management, let's say some staff information. So things like that. So they say if there are if there are multiple queries that are supported from the GraphQL, so uh, one user can even send all the five queries at once to the to the API. Then the API can be like um, like it's very hard to execute, and then it will be like um, shut down in it eventually without um, without having um, able to proceed. So, so this uh, batching attack, so we call them as batching, batching attacks. So these can, we have to prevent, uh, think of that and prevent that as well to limit the number of queries uh, that can execute in parallel. 
So I'll just add one more thing. Uh, that is, uh, so Malinta explained about de depth limiting uh, and uh, amount limiting and the batch uh, uh, the batch precaution. There's something, uh, another thing, which is cost analysis. So even though all these things are correct, like the depth might be small, the amount might be small, and the, the batch uh, the batch also might be small, but the query could be still costly. So uh, <clears throat> there, there should be a way to uh, calculate the cost of the incoming query and then decide uh, to whether to block it or allow it uh, before executing the GraphQL resolvers on the back end. So uh, how to do it uh, depends. There are various ways that there are some researches coming up and various algorithms coming up. There are primarily two ways called static and dynamic, uh, which uh, the, the goal of that is to find an upper bound, the upper bound of the incoming query's cost. And if it exceeds a certain limit, then you don't allow it to uh, uh, hit the resolver. So some of the API management gateways already support this. Uh, it just doesn't have to be applied at the gateway. You could still do it at the service level as well. There are some GraphQL libraries which already support this. But uh, <clears throat> we would suggest that all these uh, precautions better to be taken at the gateway level uh, in order to protect your GraphQL APIs. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you both for the uh, comprehensive answer. Um, uh, we had a question came in around um, why PKC is recommended for use in, in mobile apps. Uh, what are your uh, yeah views? Okay, should I go over that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So fast time. Okay. okay. So this way around this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this uh, initially, what the mobile applic the auth specification was recommending for mobile application was this. Uh, uh, the authorization code ground. Uh, but the problem is mobile applications are uh, treated as uh, public clients, which means that you, you cannot store a secret safely in the mobile application. There could uh, be a, uh, some attacks that could steal these secrets. So there's no point of uh, uh, storing secrets in it. So uh, <clears throat> if there are like a couple of applications in your if let's say there is a legitimate application and there is a, an att attacker's application in your mobile device, uh, the the mobile de the attacker's application can register uh, its redirect URLs as similar to the legitimate application's URL. Now, in this case, uh, there is a possibility that the code returned from the authorization server is returned to the attacker's application, not the legitimate application. So if that happens, uh, then since the attacker attacker's attacker has the code, he could exchange it to, with the uh, uh, access token, right? So we don't want that to happen. And that is why uh, the auth, uh, working committee uh, recommends uh, the PKCE grant, which is uh, how it works is like it generates a secret on the fly, right? It doesn't store any secret on the uh, application itself, but it generates a secret on the fly and does some hashing and matches this. And it ensures that only the legitimate application can receive the uh, token, not the attacker's application. So uh, this is how it, the TKC uh, grant, uh, grant type was introduced, but now, we see that uh, in the in the auth 2.1 draft that uh, many of the application types what they're recommending is to use the pkc uh, grant uh, for example the, the browser client side uh, javascript apps and uh, all those applications can now use the pkc grant because that is what they see that is what they uh, say as the most uh, secure one So I think a small thing and on small addition to that, like so, so, so people like usually has a practice to uh, to to use the credentials. So generate, we generate the credentials and then encode it inside, like the the hard code it inside then inside the mobile apps, like in Android apps or something. So so it is very, I mean, very can be very um, can be a very big security breach because this 
if you reverse engineer these apps, you can easily figure out these access tokens. So figure out these credentials and then uh, you can get uh, access to these uh, backend endpoints. So this is a very common thing in, even in even in the in the present, like uh, there are cases these apps car, uh, so hackers are exploited these apps and then uh, getting the personal information, getting access, getting administrative access to these uh, backend APIs and getting lots of personal um, uh, information from the user. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I'd i like to um, ask, this, this is a technical question, um, uh, about asking for some explanation around broken object level authorization in OWASP top 10. Um, uh, Faisal, you, were, you, you called this one out as something that, uh, that, that you're hearing quite a bit from people. Um, right, yeah, so even Maleta mentioned this uh, initially about the OS project, right? So the OS uh, API uh, project has listed down 10 uh, most API, the 10 most uh, vulnerabilities in APIs. So that is, uh, that is what they see very often uh, and they have listed these down and they have also mentioned uh, what kind of precautions that you could take. Uh, maybe Malinda, you could put it uh, put the link up of the OS uh, API project on the chat. Uh, right. So uh, in that, uh, the broken object level authorization is the like the first one uh, which is mentioned in there, which means that that is what the uh, that is what the most but that is what they see most common. So what happens there is like, for example, let's take uh, an API which uh, uh, sends uh, personal data uh, and it depends on some ID. So let's say my ID is number three, right? So my uh, if I send a request with ID number three and it sends my information. Now, if someone figures out, let's try to uh, increment this value and see what I get, like someone puts in four, right? Then Malinth's information comes in, right? But uh, the, so so it means that there is a, a security breach, right? I can see Malinth's information, so the authorization is broken. So one of the ways that we could fix this is to first the easiest way to fix this would be to use like non-guessable strings, like UUIDs, instead of like one, two, three. You use a, a big string to identify a specific uh, user. So uh, that is one way, or else you can put a gateway uh, in the middle and then pass a security uh, access token, which, uh, which then translates to the correct ID, right? So now the user does not, uh, the, the consumer application sends only the access token, right? Not the ID. It is the gateway which trans do, does the translation. So then, uh, then the attacker cannot just uh, randomly guess and get the data for, of another user. So that is what uh, mainly the object level authorization means. So the idea is that you should fix it in a way that you cannot uh, uh, get another person's data. This is, the example was just about personal data, but this applies to anything. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask um, an, another question around token types. Um, what do you what do you recommend maybe one for malinta um opaque or jwt what's uh, what's your perspective yeah so so this is about all two tokens so actually um so so opaque token seems like so so let's say when we are thinking about an api gateway who uh, who is uh, uh, validating this token and getting access so giving access to the their back giving access to some APIs. So this uh, OPAC tokens is kind of a, some sort of a, some, um, some random string and random set of characters. So these are uh, actually doesn't like, doesn't have any, any, any kind of information. It's just uh, some sort of a reference. So the gateway or the token, the person, the, the, the entity who validate the token need to always need to rely entirely rely on someone else to validate the token because, uh, so it might, so maybe it is, uh, it, uh, the gateway me might have to call some sort of an inter external key manager or some sort of an IDP to, to validate the token. So, so the, the problem is it, uh, when, when it comes to scalability, so it is, 
little bit difficult because uh, so when let's say you want to entire the let's say you want to uh, scale the entire application you need to scale scale the gateway and also the entity who uh, entity which validate the uh, validate the tokens need to be scaled as well so so it is kind of a bit difficult when when you think about scaling so um, but um, but relatively if you, if you think about jwt and opac uh, the opac thing is relatively easy to implement so so most of mostly the, from the from a earlier in earlier development api uh, development lots of lots of apis came from opac one for now so people are tend to go to this uh, jwt thing because uh, the jwt tokens are actually self contained which means it has almost all the data that it need to it need to have to to validate to validate like so the gateway or the per, the, the entity who validate the token doesn't actually need to rely on someone else to validate the token so that is the main main advantage so the the problem with jwt so so the earlier problem with uh, uh, opac token which is scaling actually solved by the jwt because we actually don't need to scale the uh, so it actually uh, the uh, the gateway self validating the token so then we there is, so when it comes to scaling it is easy to get, scale the gateway only so so that so in that sense we get an advantage and uh, and also when uh, implementing the jwt token based uh, security we we there are some extra steps that we need to take because uh, uh, when we to think about token revocations uh, so so when it comes to token revocation it is very easy when we when we go with the opac token token approach because the token so we we revoke the token from the the validator validation entity so then so the the gateway will always ask from the validation the the entity who validates the token to 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 check whether the token is valid so so the jwt case it is not because the the gateway might doesn't might not know whether this uh, jwt is already um, revoked so so there need to be extra steps taken to notifies those uh, revocations uh, to the api gateway uh, so 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 those extra steps need to be taken so so if we take took that um, the jwt is actually better than uh, when we uh, think about both and does that answer um, Sonka's question too about how we can get uh, user details if we use an opaque token for authentication yeah so uh, so what happens is like it doesn't actually matter whether it's an OPAC token or JWT token if you want to send user details to the backend. So let's say it's an OPAC token, it's a random string, it's coming into the gateway. The gateway is going to ask the authorization server about the details of the user and fetch all the information, right? And then construct, a, construct the JWT and send it to the backend. But in case of the uh, self contained token, which is the JWT token, uh, most probably it doesn't need to ask any 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 other entity about the user details it can contain all the user information as well but uh, sometimes it might not contain but in that case also you could refer some other entity and get the user details and then send the information to the uh, back end so actually actually it doesn't matter whether you're using an opac token or a jwt token uh, the user details if you want to send it to the back end uh, any context can be sent uh, via the JWD to the back end. Well, thank you so much. Um, hopefully that Sunka has answered your uh, your question suitably. I'm actually conscious that we are um, going to need to wrap up. Um, and uh, perhaps I'd invite um, Fazlan and Melinda just to give us a couple of couple of minutes of, of summary of uh, uh, you know, messages, takeaways for the audience. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we've just got a couple of minutes left, so that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go first. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we need API security, right? So we are work we are working with multiple APIs these days. It's not just a REST anymore, right? We GraphQL, gRPC, and everything is in the picture. So it's uh, most probably one developer is working on many types of APIs. So the idea is that 
we have to uh, uh, there are common security precautions that we can take uh, uh, regardless of the api type but there are also some things that uh, need to be uh, considered uh, uh, depending on the api type so we need to be vigilant about those things as well just not to understand how the api type works and also understand the security related to that api and take those precautions in order to secure your api so like uh, thank you claire for having us and uh, the organizers uh, organizers of api uh, for organizing this no thank you to um uh, to yourselves for putting the time in uh uh later in the afternoon that it is for you um but also uh to um the wso to team for this uh, sponsorship at this conference um which enables uh us to uh, um, run round tables and, and get an opportunity to talk to those of you uh, technical experts who are um, actually working at the coalface of uh, uh, in the engineering teams of these tools. So a real privilege for uh, uh, the audience. And um, Shihan has pointed out that uh, uh, you will be around at the WSO2 booth. Um, if people have more questions, um, they can ask uh, uh, you directly there. Is there any other way that they can get hold of you? Um, uh, yeah. Um, they could uh, find us in Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or LinkedIn. E email us. Yeah. Well, all the usual channels. So um, uh, yeah, we have also the Slack channel as well. So like, um, so we can, uh, so anybody can uh, oh, come and uh, discuss uh, about any technical question related to API manager or any kind of product. Well, that's really so, useful. Could you yeah. um, could you add that into the um online chat? I'm sure that uh, uh, some people here might be interested in uh, um. Yeah, sure. sure. Just add, add the details in there. That'll be great. Um, so thank you all um, uh, for the awesome questions and uh, contribution from the audience. I hope that you've had a, an enjoyable round table and uh, that you have a great rest of the conference. Um, there's many more things still packed on the agenda for the rest of today. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Claire. Goodbye. Goodbye.